This is Miles Stanford, and for these next few moments, I'd like to share some facts with you concerning this matter of, this all-important matter of becoming a Christian. The key to becoming a Christian is that one becomes, to some degree at least, aware of their needs that one becomes dissatisfied with themselves and uh, more or less hungry for God, begin to hunger for God, and to realize that uh, the personal inadequacy and that uh, they must have something more than they have found in their own life. Well, this is uh, one of the essentials that we realize our need. And then there's only one other, and that is to come to find out what God has done about that need. First the need and then the remedy. Very simple, and the reason it is simple is because uh, everyone in the world has that need. It's just a matter of becoming aware of it. And the, the other half is the fact that God has already done something about that need. He's done it all, and he's waiting and working for us to turn to him and find out what he has done. It's a wonderful thing to realize that we don't have to produce the Christian life, we don't have to live the Christian life, but we learn to depend upon God for everything, for the beginning of it and the maintenance of it, the producing of it, and carrying it right on through into eternity. It's a wonderful thing. <clears throat> So my part in this is to share with you some facts for you to consider and then uh, make up your own mind as to how valid they are and how worthwhile they are and whether or not uh, it'll be worth your worth your while to uh, choose Godward. So <clears throat> in doing this, before we begin, I think it might be very good if we just quietly uh, bow our heads together for a moment and uh, look to God, our Father. We thank Thee for what Thou hast done on our behalf and for the fact that Thou hast revealed this work of Thine in the Bible, in the Word of God. And so together now we will be looking into that Word and depending upon Thee to open it up to us and to reveal Thy truth to us that we might fully realize what Thou hast for us. We trust thee for this now in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, the best thing for us to do is to begin at the beginning, and we'll look in the first chapter of the Bible and get uh, the beginning of the picture of what God has done and how he's done it to take care of the need of the person who realizes he's a sinner, he realizes to some degree that he's lost, that he's not he's not a Christian, he's not sure of heaven, he's not sure of his relationship to God, uh, that person can see in the Word what God has done about that situation, and he can get it all taken care of in Christ. So we begin at the very first chapter. We look in Genesis 1 and verse 26. And God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. And this is a very key verse. that It gives it the beginning of a wonderful picture. God is setting forth his eternal purpose for man. He says, let us make man in our image. Well, of course, it isn't a physical image, but it's an image of life. It's an image of personality. It's an image of character. It's in the same image as God in that uh, the, man is able, uh, the man will be able to think and to uh, love and to... Uh, carry on fellowship with God and with with other men. That that uh, that image, that likeness of God. 
So that's what God did. He created Adam. And uh, he had fellowship with Adam, and Adam had fellowship with God. And in that Adam was the first man, he, he, he was the representative man. God made him the representative man, that the entire human race would spring from this first man. Well, the characteristics that Adam had, uh, the race would have through uh, relationship, through our being born from him. And God's purpose was that Adam would uh, grow in grace and he would become more and more godlike, and therefore the race that sprang from this Adam would be in fellowship with God, and that God would be able to have fellowship with the entire human race. There would be that relationship there, and that would go on forever. Well, that was the initial purpose. And the, the position was that God was creator and Adam was the created one. God was sovereign and Adam was subject. And as long as this was maintained, everything would go forward because, after all, God, uh, God, this universe belongs to God and Adam was uh, created by God. So God knows what's best for him and God has a wonderful plan for him. So it behooves Adam to look to God and depend upon God. And he had a full full liberty of life to grow and develop, but that that all was within the circle of God's will for him. And of course, God's will was for him, not against him. And God had to put one restriction upon Adam. We read that in uh, Genesis 2.16. Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. Well, God had to put this restriction, and we'll see why in a moment. Adam was to have a choice whether he would choose to remain within the circle of God's will and go on and develop in God's purpose for him, or he would choose his own way, independent of God, and disobey God, which would be sin. So we we see what happened, that Satan who wanted to be in God's place. He wanted to take over God's realm. He said, I will be as God. Satan realized that if he could conquer, tempt and conquer this representative man, he would spoil God's purpose and he would win the entire human race away from God if he could win the representative man. So that's what happened, that Satan tempted Adam and Eve to partake of that tree of good and evil, the knowledge of good and evil. And Eve, and both Eve and Adam, did eat of that tree. They both acted independent of God. They both stepped out of the circle of God's will for them, and they sinned. That was sin. And God told them, he had warned them, that if you do this, you will surely die. And the instant they chose their way as against God's way for them, that constituted sin. And the wages of sin is death. The wages of sin is death. And they both died instantly. They died spiritually. They were cut off from the source of life. They were cut off from God. God is the source of all life. They died physically years later. And they died physically years later because of this spiritual death that set in immediately. The outcome was, years later, physical death. Well, after they died spiritually, and before they died physically, we read in Galatians, in Genesis 5.3, Adam begat a son in his own likeness after his image. Adam begat Seth. Well, here the human race is springing from the fallen Adam. The human race is not coming from the man who is in the image of God now. Adam has fallen into sin. He's fallen into death. He's fallen out of the kingdom of light 
He stepped into the kingdom of darkness. He stepped out of God's kingdom into Satan's kingdom. And as such, a fallen, sinful, representative man, he is bringing forth the human race. Adam begat a son in his own likeness after his image. And there's where the human race is today. Every man born into this world springs directly from Adam, and he's lost in trespasses and sins. He's a sinner because of his family, his original head, Adam. He's born a lost sinner, every man who enters this world, just because of the way he's born. He becomes a sinner actually in his walk later on, because he chooses to sin, he'll choose bad as over against good, and he'll, he'll he'll become a sinner in his own right. But he's born a sinner, and he becomes a sinner. He he sins because he's already a sinner. He doesn't become a sinner because he sins. A man sins because he's born a sinner. That's his nature. And we look here in Romans 5.12. For by one man sin entered into the world, into humanity, and death by sin. The wages of sin is death. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. By one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. So you see, God works through a single man here. And uh, this man failed and turned from God, and he's brought forth ruin to the world. And man has become self-centered instead of God-centered. He's alive unto self and he's dead unto God. And uh, Ephesians 2 tells us that uh, everyone born into this world is dead in trespasses and sins. And by nature, uh, the children of wrath, the understanding is darkened and they're alienated from the life of God. And everyone in this world uh, who is not a Christian, who is not born again, uh, they're cut off from God through death. And if they continue on in their course, they'll just have to go down into eternal death because that's their nature. That's the wages of sin. That's the natural outcome of their natural birth. <clears throat> and we see here in uh, first, uh, 2 Corinthians 4, verse 3 and 4, If our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Well, Paul here is saying that the gospel, the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, is hidden to the lost, and it's hidden because they're cut off from God by death. They're blinded by the God of this world. It's a small g, God of this world. Or well, who's the God of this world? The God of this world is Satan. Satan conquered <clears throat> the human race by conquering the first Adam, the head of the human race. And he conquered him by right of conquest. And in conquering Adam, he conquered the world. And this poor old sin-sick world at present belongs to Satan, the god of this world. And everyone in this world who is unsaved belongs to Satan. And they all are to share Satan's fate unless they come to the Lord Jesus Christ. Simply because of their nature. Simply because of the way they've been born. Simply because of the family they're in. The one man. All right. Now we're concentrating on this death side first to bring out what this one man brought out, brought about. Look in 1 Corinthians 2.14. The natural man, or the unsaved man, or the man from Adam, receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. He, he just is in the wrong family. He does not understand the other family that the spiritual, the Christian family. He doesn't understand. He's not able to understand. He doesn't have the right nature. Because the carnal or fleshly mind is enmity against God. 
for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And that's the nature of the lost man, the sinner. He has the very nature in him that Satan has, the very same attitude, basically, toward God. And uh, under the right circumstances, this attitude is revealed. It's there in every in every single unsaved person. It's there. It's their nature, and they they partook of it when the head of their race turned to Satan and turned away from God. It all happened because of Adam. Man is not only guilty and lost, but he's a rebel, he's an outlaw, and he's an avowed enemy of God. In other words, man is helpless in himself to do anything about this. He may struggle and seek to be better and to do good, but he cannot reach God's standard. He cannot get over into the right family of himself. He's in the wrong family. And God says about the man who was born into this world, everyone, <clears throat> God says there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. Now we must remember that God is saying this. And of course, it's God's standard. And when God says none doeth good, then no, not one. Uh, we may, uh, the unsaved may do a lot of good According to man's standard, it may be wonderful. But the holy God has to say, no, no good, no, not one. Why? Because there is no good in the wrong family. Nothing that God can accept because it comes from a sinful source. Even the good is sinful. It's just the wrong relationship. And God has already rejected the first Adam because that Adam freely turned to the enemy. God says, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Why? Because all have been born from Adam. And God says that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. And that's what he is working to, that the unsaved man, the sinner, realizes that his guilt he realizes his need. His mouth is stopped. No more self-righteousness flows out of his mouth. No more excuses. His mouth is stopped. He realizes that he's guilty before God. That is the need that he must come to. And when the man is brought to that need, where he sees his guilt and need, then the man is ready to consider what God has for him. But not until... If the man isn't needy, he's not going to turn to God. So God in his mercy brings about our need. In one way or another, he shows us that we're in the wrong family. Oh, it's hard. It's hard to face up to. It's hard, hard to acknowledge. But oh, it's the very way of salvation. It's the very way to become a Christian. Now we've looked at God's first man, the first Adam. And all that has sprung from that Adam is death. The wages of sin is death. Adam turned from God and he brought death into this world. He brought death into this human race. And all are born, as far as God is concerned, they're born dead in trespasses and sin. They're alive to themselves. They're alive in this world. They're alive to each other. But they're dead to God. There's no rapport there. There's no fellowship. There's no relationship. Every man is in the wrong family. Well, now, what did God do about this? This is what we want to see. What has God done about this? Well, there's a wonderful thing to see here, that what God has done about it is complete. It takes care of everything. It is holy and just and right and it is judicially perfect. It is done in the court of law, the courts of heaven, and no one can question it, no one can point a finger at it and say, there's a loophole here, or there's something done wrong here. Never. God 
has taken care of this question of sin and death in his perfect way. And we want to look at the next in the next few moments here, we want to look and see the facts in the Word of God, in the eternal Bible, see what God has done about this problem. Oh, it's wonderful to see. And we look here in Hebrews 1, and the first verse of Hebrews 1, God hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the world, who, being the brightness of God's glory and the express image of God's person. Now he's saying here that the Lord Jesus Christ is the image of God. And here we have, when we see the Lord Jesus in the Bible, we see God's image on earth, back on earth. God has given us a new image, a new head man, the head of a new race, the Lord Jesus Christ. In other words, he's started all over again. He's not sought to patch up Adam. He's given us a new Adam. Now, in Adam's fall and all the sin and death that came in on the whole human race, it isn't that God, that Adam spoiled things for God and that God had to... Uh, cross that off, so to speak, and start all over again. It isn't that at all. The entire process is right in the center of God's program and purpose, and God did not deviate one iota. He kept right on coming. He knew all about it, and he has it all planned, and there's nothing out of the way. It is all of God, and he is working it all out. He has worked it all out. And he simply is continuing, and he's going. To, he's completing the whole problem, the whole purpose, in a new Adam, in his Son. Look here in 1 Corinthians 15:45. The first Adam was made a living soul, and the last Adam was made a life-giving spirit. Now here we have two Adams. Well, we know that the first Adam sinned and turned from God and sinned and brought death. And now God has introduced the last Adam. He hasn't introduced the second or third or fourth Adam. The Lord Jesus is the last Adam. There won't be any more. There won't have to be any more. He's the last Adam. And then in Corinthians 15, 1 Corinthians 15, the first man is of the earth, earthy. That's the first Adam. He's called the first man. He's the head of the race. And, uh, of course, the word Adam means red earth. And God created Adam. He made Adam from the earth. The first man is of the earth, earthy. The second man is the Lord from heaven. The Lord Jesus is called the last Adam, and he's also called the second man. He's not called the second Adam. He's the last Adam, but he's called the second man. And the word here says, As we have borne the image of the earthy, we shall also bear the image of the heavenly. That's a promise from God in his word. That we're born in the image of the earthy Adam. Lost. We're sinners. We're dead to God. He says, We shall also bear the image of the heavenly man. And that's one of God's promises to us. Well, we're going to see how he works this out. And we notice here that the second man is the Lord from heaven. And the Lord Jesus said, For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And he also said in John 17, And now after he had done the work that God sent him to do, then he says to God, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. And here we see that the Lord Jesus Christ was with God from all eternity. He's God the Son. And that he came down into this world to do a work of God in our behalf, and then he went back to be with his Father. So he's He's, he's God who became man. 
He's not a man who became God or anything like that. He's God who became man. Well, let's see how God worked this out. Remember, it all has to be legal. It all has to be perfectly done. It all has to be done just the way a holy God would do it. And we think here of the virgin birth in Luke 1, 31, where the angel said to the Virgin Mary, Thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. And then she questioned the angel and said, Well, how can this be? I, I, I know not a man. I'm not married. I, I, how is this going to happen? And the Holy Spirit, the angel t- said to her, The Holy Spirit shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. That holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And that's the way God the Son entered the human race. He entered the human race just as we did. He was born into it. He became a man through birth through a woman. He did not have a human father as we did. God is his father and the Holy Spirit placed him in the Virgin Mary's womb and he was born a child. And the only difference between our birth and his birth is that he, because of the virgin birth, because of who his father was, God, he was born sinless. This holy thing which shall be born of thee. The Lord Jesus was born sinless. We were born sinners. Well, the the purpose of his being born sinless and the purpose of his living a sinless life in this world for 33 years was that he could die for our sins in his sinless person. Now, a sinner can't atone or pay for his sins. It has to be someone who is sinless, who can who can do anything about sin. Therefore, we had to have a sinless Savior, and he had to be God. And that is who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And he entered this world, and he entered this human race in a sinless way by being born of the Virgin. Human mother, but divine father. Now, let's see here an example about his <clears throat> living his life on earth here as a sinless sinless one, as uh, God the Son. We remember now that he is the last Adam, as over against the first Adam. And for God to work this thing out correctly and honestly and perfectly and in a holy way, it had to be done that there was a second man who must succeed where the first man failed. There had to be a last Adam succeed where the first Adam failed. And he had to succeed under the same circumstances and limitations uh, in which the first Adam failed. And he had to be tempted to do the same thing in the same way by the same person as the first Adam was. And that's exactly what happened in the wilderness where the Holy Spirit led the Lord Jesus into the wilderness and the Lord Jesus fasted for 40 days. He was in hunger. And Satan sought to tempt him to eat something. The very temptation that he laid upon the first Adam. He was attacking here the last Adam. Because he knew that if he could get the last Adam to step out of God's will for him and to go his own way, choose his own way in the face of God's will for him, that Satan would have conquered the last Adam. Therefore, he would have the entire human race. He would have the spiritual race. He would have everything. He would become God. He would have conquered everything. And that's exactly what he was seeking to do in the wilderness is to get the last Adam over on his side. And the Lord Jesus was facing this temptation for us. It was a very personal thing. He was doing it on our behalf, that he might be our Savior. 
And as we look at this temptation, we must realize that this was going on for each one of us. So Satan, in uh, Luke 4, the devil said to the Lord Jesus, If thou, he questioned him there, If thou be the Son of God, command this stone that it be made bread. And Jesus, the Lord Jesus Christ, being God, he could have done it. And he was hungry, 40, year, 40 days fasting. He was hungry and hungered. But the Lord Jesus said, answered him and said, It is written that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. And the Lord Jesus was not going to do anything until God told him. Nothing outside of God's will. And God didn't tell him to make that stone to be bread. God didn't tell him to eat at that time. He didn't have a word from God, so he wouldn't do it. Well, then Satan saw another angle, and he took him up onto a high mountain to show him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. And Satan said to the Lord Jesus, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them, for that is delivered unto me. And to whomsoever I will, I give it. Now here's Satan talking about the whole world, all the kingdoms of the world. And you notice the Lord Jesus didn't challenge him, he didn't question him one word about it. The Lord Jesus acknowledged by his silence that this world does belong to Satan and that he is in control of it. So the enemy, the devil said to him, All this power will I give thee and the glory of them. If thou wilt worship me, all shall be thine. Think of that, Satan seeking to get God the Son to worship him. He wanted to be God. And the Lord Jesus, he's going to get this world and the universe in due time anyway. He didn't have to get it right then. From Satan, he's going to get it by just way, or just uh, relying upon God and following God's will. So he said, "Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and Him only shalt thou serve." And he just countered these temptations by staying within the will of God and showing Satan what God said in His Word. And then, of course, Satan sought to tempt him again about uh, falling from the pinnacle of the temple and protecting himself. He says, cast yourself down. He said, the angels will take care of thee. And uh, the Lord Jesus says that, that uh, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. That thou shalt not uh, do something to just uh, prove that God will take care of you. God uh, hasn't told me to leap from the pinnacle, so I'm not going to do it. And he stayed within the realm of God's will for him at that time. So Satan left him. And then, after he had uh, conquered Satan in this way, then he... Then then God gave him something to eat. God took care of him. God wasn't going to let him down, and he knew it. And the Lord Jesus was ministered uh, by, uh, by angels. He was taken care of uh, after that ordeal. He knew that God wouldn't let him down, but he also knew that it would be unthinkable to uh, turn from God to Satan in any way, no matter what the circumstances. So that our last Adam was not taken over by the enemy as the first Adam was. <clears throat> we see here in 1 Corinthians 15, For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. There's the picture right in one little sentence. If we're in Adam, we're dead. And the thing is to come over to Christ's side so that we can live. Well, now let's go a little further in this picture of how God has worked this out for us. And we think of the word mediator. A mediator is one who stands between two parties to mediate, to reconcile, if there's a difference between them. And the Lord Jesus is called, one of his names, one of the terms for him is he's a mediator. He's our mediator between God and man. Well, if he's going to be the medi mediator, he, there's certain conditions that must be fulfilled, very stringent, very strict and perfect conditions that must be met. 
the race was ruined through a man, and therefore it must be redeemed. It must be bought back to God through a man. The first Adam, all he brought was disobedience and sin and death and judgment. And uh, the, the last Adam, the Lord Jesus, he brought obedience and grace and life and justification. Just the opposite. Well, because of sin, because of the family that we're born into naturally, uh, God is morally unable to have fellowship with us, with a, with a sinner. And, of course, the sinner is morally unable to have access to a holy God. The sin and death separates them so that there is a mediator needed. And this mediator must be one who is accepted and trusted by both parties to be a real mediator. Well, now, uh, God accepts his son, doesn't he? And he trusts his son. He said of the Lord Jesus, he said, This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear ye him. And God asks us to accept and to trust his son, doesn't he? To uh, take our half of the mediation, so to speak, to enter into our part of the mediation by, by accepting the mediator. God accepts him. Well, further, he's a mediator because uh, this mediator is one who must partake both of God's nature and of man's nature. Now, there's mediation. He enters into the nature of both parties involved. He always was God. He always had God's nature. And by uh, the birth of the Virgin Mary, through the uh, birth of the Virgin Mary, his birth in the Virgin Mary, he, he entered our nature. He entered man's nature. In Philippians 2, who, being in the form of God, made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men, being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Now, the Lord Jesus Christ didn't have to die. He had no sin. He, he just lived forever because death comes by sin. Well, he went to the cross to die the worst of death, the most humble and shameful criminal death, the cross, and the most painful and extended and drawn-out death that's what he went through, the sinless one, to pay for our sin, to atone for our sin, that he could be our Savior. So this mediator also must be one who in this work of reconciliation, he would represent both God and man equally. Think of that right in between the two, a holy God and a lost human race. He's one who would satisfy every claim of God upon man and every claim of man upon God. Well, now, God has a lot of claims upon us, doesn't he? He's God. He's the ruler of this universe. He, he's God. And we're, in our natural birth, we're nothing but lost sinners. Well, the claim that God has upon us, he knows that we can't meet, so he met it in his Son. So God has a lot of claims, but he, he put all the claims upon his Son. And all of his claims were met in Christ. Now, the claim that we have upon God, there's one basic claim that we do have upon God. And that is that we are lost, hell-bound sinners because of our natural birth. We couldn't help it. That's the way we were born. We had nothing to do with it. So we have it, and we can't do anything about it. We're just in the wrong family. No matter how good we live or good, how good we try to live, we're still drawing from the wrong source, a sinful source, a source that a holy God cannot accept. So the claim that we have upon God is, I can do nothing about it, you have to do something for me. And that's exactly what he's done. He sent his son to take our place in the death that sin demands. The wages of sin is death. And the Lord Jesus Christ entered that death for us. Now it's important to see <clears throat> that we have, God has produced, he sent the perfect mediator. There is a mediator 
between God and needy man, and that's the Lord Jesus Christ. And the wonderful thing about it is that God, in all of this, he's not only done it all, but he is bringing it all right to us. That's the wonderful thing to see. He's always made the first move. God always has been aggressive about this thing. And man has always fled from God, but God continues to pursue him. We see that in the, this wonderful verse of John 3.16, that God so loved the world, he so loved humanity, that he gave his only begotten son. He, God gave, God sent him. He made the first move. He, he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever puts their trust in him, uh, shall not perish, but has, hath everlasting life. Well, the, the Son is everlasting life, and so if we have the Son, we have life. If we put our trust in the Son and rely upon Him, if we receive Him as our Savior, we have Him, we have life. The two are bound together, the two are synonymous. The Lord Jesus is the life of God. He's eternal life. He's the last Adam that didn't sin and go into death. He, he came from God. He's the life of God. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man, no man cometh unto the Father but by me. Well, God is the aggressor, and so is the Lord Jesus. Uh, we see in the word, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. And he is he's also aggressive. He is seeking out those who are ready to receive him. Well, <clears throat> we think here of 2 Corinthians 5.19. All things are of God. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now look at this. Listen to this. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. Now what more could God have done? God the Son, God the Son came down into this world, into our race, to reconcile us to himself. What more could he have done? Nothing. Uh, and he was the offended one. He was the holy one sinned against. Think of it. And he humbled himself and became in fashion as a man to come and to woo and to win man. And the only way he could win man was to pay for his sin. And the wages of sin being death, he had to die. And in that he was pure and holy in himself, after he had paid the wages of our sin, he was able to rise from the dead because he himself had no sin. He was therefore free to come out from under the penalty of sin after it had been paid for us. That's why the Lord Jesus rose again from the dead, free. Because his perfect holy life paid for all of our sin in his death. All things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ. God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. For God hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God laid our sin upon the perfect, holy Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the cross. And he took our sin down into death and paid the wages, death, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And when we take the Lord Jesus Christ as our payment, we receive his righteousness, and God sees us in Christ as righteous. God has made Christ to be our righteousness. Well, if he's done all that, we certainly can't earn it, can we? We don't have to earn it. There's nothing for us to do but to receive that which God has already done, and only God could have done it perfectly. It took a perfect Savior. How could we as a sinner ever do anything 
uh, to alleviate our sin. We're in the wrong family. It's the wrong source. All we can bring forth is sin in God's eyes because we're, we have that nature. Well, look what the Word says in Romans 4, 5. To him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So if we stop seeking to work and to gain credit with God, which we can never do, simply believe on the one who is accepted by God, him that justifieth the ungodly, then our faith is counted for righteousness. And he says that he justifies the ungodly, the ones who are in the ungodly race. He doesn't say we're to become better and to become godly, then he'll justify us. No, he justifies the ungodly. And in uh, Romans 5, 6, For when we were yet without strength, couldn't produce anything, in due time Christ died for the ungodly. God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. All we have to do is see that we're sinners and to see that the Lord Jesus Christ died for us. Those are the two factors in becoming a Christian. We have the need. God has the answer. And the answer is in His Son who says, Trust me, rely upon me, receive me. And the need is met. <clears throat> no, it's not by works. In Ephesians 2.8, For by grace are ye saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God. Well, there's the gift again in, in, our, in, our, in our verse of John 3.16. For God so loved the human race, God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son. The Lord Jesus is the gift of God. For by grace, are you saved through faith, faith in God's gift? And that not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. If we could earn our salvation, we would enter heaven uh, boasting that we, well, I made it on my own. I'm a self-made man. And I got up here on my own. What, what a terrible thing when we're just sinners born in the wrong family. And that we can enter heaven and our boast will be in the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, uh, I'm here because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for me and what he is to me. I'm here because I'm resting in him. And he's my savior. There, who gets the glory then? Well, the one who, who uh, should have it, and that's the Lord Jesus. Yes, uh, it's not by works, and, and we're also we're justified completely. Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that through this man the Lord Jesus, is preached unto you forgiveness of sins. And by him all that believe are justified from all things. We're justified from all things because when we trust the Lord Jesus Christ, we're taken out of Adam and we're placed in the first Adam, the wrong family, we're placed in the right family. We're born again into the Lord Jesus Christ. He becomes the head of our new family. We are now in the family of God. Now we're in the right source. Now God is able to accept us after we trust the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's a matter of saying, the first Adam, I realize, has gotten me into trouble, and I long and I hunger for the last Adam. And Lord Jesus, I see that you are the last Adam, and I trust you. I choose to come over to your side and I receive you as my own personal Savior. I receive you as my own last Adam, the head of a new spiritual race in the kingdom of God. Well, in John 3.36, we, we have the fact that he that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. Well, that's perfectly logical because the Lord Jesus Christ is life. So if we have him, we have life. And he's everlasting. He's eternal life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life. Well, that's the way we are when we're born into this world. We don't believe in him as we grow up. And we have to make a choice. After we find out our need, we have to choose from one atom to the other. 
And God says, He that heareth my word, the Lord Jesus said, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. When we trust the Lord Jesus, we're born again, we're passed from the first Adam, and we're created anew in the last Adam. We're passed from death unto life. Now see what God says in 1 John 5. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. These things have I written unto you that believe in the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. <clears throat> and God makes it all very clear that all we need is the person, and he is received by an intelligent, heart and head based, fact founded faith, that we see what the Word says, and we rely upon that Word, and we do what the Word says. We simply choose. We receive Him. I remember 26 years ago that I was, I'd grown up to be a drunkard, 27 years old. I didn't even know John 3.16. All I knew I finally came to realize that I was lost, that I was undone, that I was a sinner, that God was holy. That's all I knew. And I, on the 19th of September, 1940, I, I stepped over the line, so to speak. I, I said, I choose God. I want to be in his family. I didn't know any more than that. And then a friend came and showed me John 3.16 and showed me that the Lord Jesus had died for me. And I simply received the Savior. 26 years ago, he's never failed me since. I failed him many times. He never fails me. He has stood firm, and he always will. And the Word of God said, As many as received him, to them gave he power or authority to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And he's asking you, dear friend, right now, to think these things through, to make your choice between these two atoms. And God stands and waits, the Lord Jesus stands and waits, for you to simply say, Lord Jesus, I thank thee for dying for me and rising again. I thank thee that thou art the Savior. I choose thee as my Savior. I choose life in thee. That is the making, that instant is the making of a Christian because we enter into the new position, we enter into the new Adam, the last Adam, and we're born again by the Spirit of God. That simple faith in Christ of receiving him as our new Adam, that is being born again. God does it all inside. We simply receive the one who died in our behalf and paid for our sin. May the Lord bless you as you decide in favor of the Lord Jesus Christ.